Next on our agenda, I would like to introduce you to one of our first year professors, Brendan Murphy. Brendan is a physical watershed scientist from our School of Environmental Science. And Brendan teaches EVSC 100, Introduction to Environmental Science. And this is either going to be one of your required courses or an elective, depending on your program area. Uh, Brendan is going to share a bit about some of his research and a bit about his course. So over to you, Brendan, and I will stop sharing my screen here. You're muted. Thanks. Um... Hopefully you can hear me and see this now. So um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, I am a new assistant professor in the School of Environmental Science, as Donna said, and I'm a physical watershed scientist. And so for those of you who don't know what that means exactly, uh, it means that I study the physical interactions between rock, water, sediment, and biological populations in natural river systems. So, um, you know, whether we're in geography or environmental science or earth science, um, you know, most of what we do is sort of tied to the sort of globe and where we are on the planet. Um, and so I think I like to do sort of my introductions of myself and where I came from uh, in sort of a geospatial way. So um, I was born and raised in Austin, Texas. So if you catch me saying y'all or howdy, uh, I make no apologies for that. Um, and I went to school out in the East Coast in Virginia, where I did some field work um, with a degree in geology. And then um, I've sort of thrown together a, a slew of photos here of sort of the places I've lived and things I've done. Um, but most of it has been here in sort of Western United States, um, living in places like Tucson and Logan, Utah, um, associated with the universities there, um, doing my PhD at the University of Texas back sort of in my hometown. Um, and then all these little green triangles are showing you sort of all of the places I've, uh, well, not all of them, but many of the places that I've done field work. Um, and then, of course, where we are, or where I have landed, and many of you may land um, here at SFU. So um, I also wanted to highlight that, you know, beyond sort of North America, um, being an earth scientist and an environmental scientist has taken me many places. Um, so these are just a sort of scattering of places that I've been specifically for work, um, not just for travel, but everywhere from New Zealand to Taiwan um, to Scandinavia. Um, I've been to the, the Arctic a couple times in a few different places, and I spent a lot of time um, doing field work in, in Hawaii as well. So just kind of highlighting that a career in, in earth and environmental science can sort of take you all over the place. Um, so to talk to you a little bit about my research and what I do and, and where I sort of go with this, um, a place that's sort of near and dear to my heart that I've spent a lot of time is um, Hawaii. And so here's a, a scattering of sort of the ooh and ah photos from Hawaii, right, of, of Mauna Kea um, volcano snorkeling on the coast, you know, these beautiful rainbows. Um, but that's not exactly why I was there. I was actually there doing, doing research. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in the jungle and in the desert there, thinking about how precipitation influences river erosion. Um, so I've spent probably about five summers there collecting, collecting data and doing field work. Um, as I said, I've also gone up to the Arctic a number of times. Um, so one of those times was up on the north slope of Alaska. Uh, we were there at the very end of the winter. Um, there was still sort of ice on all the lakes. Um, and what we were doing, was doing some long-term ecological monitoring of those Arctic lakes. So we were ice fishing, catching fish, um, monitoring and collecting a lot of the vitals on those fish, um, and then staying in this pretty crazy um, field station up there. It was you know, kind of like McMurdo Station in, our, in Antarctica, um, but up in Alaska. So from there, oops, I don't know if I skipped something. No, just taking a while to load. Um, I also just recently published some work um, focused on the old growth redwood forests in California. Um, so we were looking at the effects of timber harvesting on, on erosion and sediment pollution in rivers and how that might affect um, some of the, the salmonid populations in those creeks. So this was just some beautiful field work that we got to do through the old growths. 
And then from those sort of scenic, pristine landscapes, I've also gone um, to Scandinavia and I traveled around going to copper mines, gold mines, thinking about mining practices in Scandinavia. So this is actually the biggest open pit copper mine in all of Europe. Um, if you can tell, so here's a, a regular sized truck. Here's a mining truck. And that's what one of these little dots all the way down at the very bottom of this looks like. So um, just to give you a sense of scale, these are pretty big operations. But um, sort of the biggest focus of my research right now is thinking about erosion impacts after wildfire. Um, so this is just some examples of some burned landscapes that I've been in, in Texas and Arizona and other places. Um, here you can see a sort of person for scale and here's an entire road that's been washed out after this wildfire. So the, the things I focus on as a physical watershed scientist is I think about things like flooding and then these mass wasting events like mud flows and debris flows and what all of these effects can have say on our biological populations like fisheries and then also sedimentation um, and sort of all of these post fire hazards as we sort of classify them. The, the thing I spend a lot of time thinking about these days is actually what happens to all of that water and sediment after uh, it erodes off the surface and moves through the, the um, water courses. And ultimately, most of the time we have dammed most of our rivers in um, North America. And so a lot of that eventually makes its way into reservoirs downstream um, and starts to actually cause issues in terms of losing our storage capacity in those reservoirs. Um, creating what is now sort of a, a multi-billion dollar problem. Um, we regularly lose reservoirs and have to go in and dredge and excavate all of that sediment out. Um, it's a really expensive um, sort of endeavor. And, and it's also risking water supply to millions of people. Um, there's, I can't remember the exact number, but somewhere in the order of 70 to 100 million people that live in the Western uh, sort of North America. So. So what I do is I think about things sort of at this landscape scale. And so here's a sort of cartoon to, to illustrate that for you. You know, I think about sort of the wildfires that happen, the flooding, and then what happens in those reservoirs downstream. So it's really sort of tying everything together in the landscape. I think about these, these debris flows, right? I have students who go out and they're measuring all of the characteristics, trying to understand what control these processes. Um, I have students that I'm working with as well as um, a number of agencies, federal agencies that I work with, trying to understand and predict post-wildfire flooding. So that requires a lot of field work, um, going out and doing a lot of instrumentation, and then actually directly measuring those impacts to reservoirs. And so we fly these um, sort of very expensive drones and fly and drive around on boats in the reservoirs, and we can very accurately map how much sediment is making its way into those reservoirs after wildfire. So. It's a big project, it's taking a lot of work. And all of that goes into these sort of fancy computer models um, where we can actually take something like this, see if I can actually get this to play. And what we can do is actually try to track where all of that sediment moves and how it moves over time, how it moves with different flow events. So this is showing you sort of snow melt and then winter months. So we can see all that storm and we can actually track all of that sediment as it moves through entire watersheds and see how much can make its way downstream. So um, as Donna said, that sort of wraps up my, my research just to kind of give you a sense of, of my perspective and where I'm coming from as I teach my courses. Um, and I will be teaching um, the Environmental Science 100 course um, this fall. And in that course, we're gonna cover a number of topics. Um, a lot of things that I sort of get excited about and tie into my own research. You know, from sort of a, a broad 10,000 foot scale, we're, we'll talk about the different earth systems. So, you know, we're not just gonna focus on, on water and, and land like I do in my research, but we'll also ex extend that to the, um, the atmosphere and thinking about biological populations as well. We'll talk about um, some hot topics, pun intended, um, right with climate change and some of the effects of, of climate change on our, on our global systems. Um, we'll talk about water cycle and what climate change and these other sort of effects will have on our freshwater resources. We'll think about things like ocean acidification. So right when we're having changes in the carbon dioxide in our, in our global systems, what that does to our oceans. 
we can start to talk about things like land cover changes, right? So deforestation and what that might do in terms of physical processes on the landscape. And then finally, thinking about things like sustainability initiatives, right? So not just sort of going through the problems and understanding the systems, but also thinking about some of the solutions and what we can do. Um, so that's kind of a, a very brief overview of what we'll cover in, in EVSC 100 this fall, but I, I hope to see some of you there. And um, if you're interested in learning any more about my research, I do have a website. It's just my name, brendanpmurphy.org. I have a lot of my field photos um, like these on there and some information as well as some links to some podcasts um, and some, some news articles about my research if you're interested in learning more and maybe hearing about them from other people than just myself. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know if we have time for that, Donna, or what the, what the plan is, but I'm happy to turn it back over to you. Sure, we are. We do have time for questions, and I'll just ask the students if you have any questions for Brendan, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll just give you a couple minutes. I know it always takes a bit of time to think about your question and type it in, um, but please, this is your this is your chance to access some great information. Okay, we have one from Hannah. Is EVSC 100 for all students in the Faculty of Environment? Uh, I believe so. I, don't, I, I think it is a course that is available to all students. Maybe Donna can, can answer that better, but, um, but it is certainly one of the core courses in the environmental science program that I'm in. Yeah, and, and Hannah, um, even if you're not a major in EVSC, um, one of the great things of SFU is once you're admitted to SFU, you are able to take any courses um, as long as you have the prerequisite for, for them. And within our faculty of environment, um, a lot of times, even though you may be a major in geography, EVSC 100 may be part of the required courses, or sometimes there's a section where you get to choose one of, and there'll be four courses listed. So this could be one. Um, and or it would be available as an elective as well, because within your 120 credit hours for your degree, you do have to complete your program requirements, but you also have to do um, breadth requirements or electives. So yes, hope that answers your question. Probably more information than you wanted. Any other questions for Brendan? Okay, well, we won't keep you, Brendan. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing about your awesome research. And I always hear our professors talk and then I want to take all of their courses because they sound so interesting. So. Well, thanks, Donna. Thanks for inviting me. All right, take care. See you. All right, so let me just uh, figure out where we are here. Um, we're going to pass it over to Marina, and we're going to um, we're going to go on to our student speaker panel. Marina, take it away. Yes, thank you. So, to get a more personal view of being part of the environment community, we will hear from some students directly, and I think that's one of the best ways to learn about you know what it means to be a student here. Um, we have some representatives from the Geography Student Union, which is, uh, I think, the biggest department in the faculty, Geography. And we have a couple other students as well who will talk about getting involved outside of class. So first, I'll hand it over to Winnie and Jonathan, and you can decide who wants to talk or, or just one of you talk, but up to you. And they're from the GSU, so take it away. Yeah, I'll start. Well. I came here as a transfer student from Langara in 2019 and uh, getting involved was a great way to get to meet people. So to talk a little bit about the GSU, we, we represent all students that take geography courses. So whether you're declared major, minor or certificate programs. Uh, so throughout the year, uh, we organize events such as game nights, crafting career nights. And, you know, we also represent students, you know, we've been um, you know, fighting for uh, 
for uh, rooms because uh, our friends in the uh, the Bachelor Environment Student Union, they lost their space. And, you know, but during a normal semester, when we're all back on campus, you know, we've organized trips. One of the last things we did before the pandemic hit was that we went to Seattle the month before, you know, we had lockdown. And, you know, thanks to Marina for, for organizing that. And it was such a fun trip. We had it, I think it was three days, was it? Four days? Yeah, it was about four days and 21 days. students across the border. And it was awesome. Yeah. And sunny the whole time, pretty much. Oh, man, that was crazy. You know, we also have these, the Reunite Pangea hoodies, the, the ones that we sell during a normal semester. <laughs> So these are pretty popular. And we also have a common room that we hang out at. Uh, it's located at Robert C. Brown Hall. It's currently closed right now, but during a normal semester, we're gonna, we're gonna open it. And like I said, getting involved with the GSU is a great way to get to meet people and to you know, get to learn more about uh, uh, the university itself. So I hope you will get involved. I think Winnie can talk about her experiences because she, was uh, involved before I came into the school. Yeah, I did. Um, Janet, I think you introduced GSU very well. And um, so I guess I will talk a little bit about my personal experience joining this uh, Geography Student Union. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Winnie, and um, I am a geography student, and, and this is my last semester at SFU. Um, I'm also a transfer student, just like Jonathan. I uh, transfer from an international college. Um, it's called FYC. Um, it's located on uh, the Burnaby campus, um, in case any of you are wondering. Um, I, I've joined the, the Geography Student Union since my first year at SFU. Um, and I think all of you are on the right starting point because when is a better time to get involved in the Student Union um, than in your first year? Um, to be completely honest with you, I had um, no idea what a Student Union does. So, so in the beginning, I mostly sat in the weekly meetings and listened to everyone talking until I figured out um, what a student union does. Um, and before I realized, I already stayed with um, the Geography Student Union for a couple of years until today. <laughs> and um, you may ask why I should join, um, you know, why I should get involved in the geography, uh, sorry, in any student union, not just the geography, we also have archaeology and many other different student unions. Well, um, just like what Jonathan mentioned, I met really nice people there. Um, the union uh, holds events all the time. So you never know, maybe you will meet your best friend for life there. Um, and of course, joining the student unions is not just about making meaningful connections. Um, you can actually make a difference um, in your faculty as well. Um, and because the, the union is very close to the faculty, um, I was always in the loop for the latest inside scoop happening within the department or faculty. A um, few years ago, I volunteered for the uh, Faculty of Environment as an undergraduate representative in a hiring process of a hydrology professor. And I was able to sit in um, the hiring panel and participate in the discussion on which professor to hire. And I think that is still one of the coolest experience I've had um, in my university life. And um, I have been volunteering nonstop since my first year, and this is my last semester before I graduate, but I know for sure I'll be getting out of school with a valuable skill set, um, a good resume, good references, and, and of course with a lot of connections and friends. Um, and yeah, I never regretted getting involved um, in this in the student union since my first year. And I and right now um, I think it's the best time for you to get uh, to start volunteering in your student union and look out for any other um, extracurricular volunteering opportunities um, offered at SFU um, that will help you to achieve your social, academic, and career goals. Um, and I guess that's my story. Um, I'm going to send out my contact um, in the chat box just in case if you want to reach out. Um, I put this the, today's events um, personally, or if you just want to make friends or, um, you know, just 
grab a coffee chat virtually, of course. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. I would be happy to guide you through um, and answer your questions and concerns um, when you navigate at SFU. Yeah, so I will hand it Thank back you. to uh, Marina. Yeah. Any uh, questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we're going to leave it some questions open at the end once all okay. the students have spoken, if that's okay. Thank you, though. You both put that very well and, you know, summarized the student union thing very well because it is confusing. What is a student union and what do they do? They kind of do a lot of stuff. So I would definitely, you know, if you decide to come to us with you, look up what student union is in your department. And um, we are also have another rep from one of the, there's four in our faculty and we have reps from two today. So next we'll hear from Evie, who is, you know, in geography, but also archaeology. So she will talk about the infamous ass, and you can say what that stands for. Yes. So hello, I am Evie. Um, and I I'm in my last semester as well in um, geography and archaeology. I'm part of the GSU as well with uh, Jonathan and Winnie. Um, but I'm also part of the ASS, and that stands for the Archaeology Student Society. Um, they also sell merch with ASS across it, which is amazing, if I do say so myself. Um, and they also host events and all of these other things. Like you can, um, you can apply for. Um, conference funding. This is for any student union, but you can apply for conference funding for anything that's related to your department. Um, like in the GSU, a uh, conference that's uh, related to geography is the S3 conference. Um, there's also in archaeology, the SAA conference, um, Society for American Archaeology. Um, there's also a lot of events and things. Um, the the ASS hosts a meet and greet every semester that has professors and students that come together and they have free food and a lot of door prizes. Um, this semester, even though it was online, they gave away $400 in prizes, um, which is insane. Um, so be sure to just like participate and see what it's all about. Cool, oh, thank you, Evie. Awesome. So now we will hear a little bit from a couple students who are involved in different things in the faculty and maybe their unions and things like that. But we want to hear about some of the other stuff they've gotten involved with on and off campus. So let's hear from another archaeology student, Emma. So take it away. Yeah, so I'm in my second year, just finished my second year of archaeology, and uh, so I got about a semester and a half of in-person before everything shut down. But before everything shut down, I was involved in the jazz band. So um, as you can see, I'm a huge nerd from all the posters in my uh, room, and I've played trombone for six or seven years now. So I didn't want to stop just because I was at university. So I thought about joining the jazz band, which was the greatest choice of my life. Like I met so many new friends in the jazz band. Um, and not only that, but they're people who share the same passion that I do for music. And so we played like a whole bunch of fun songs. We also crushed some really awesome jazz pieces and we performed them for family and friends. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't get to do that for the second semester, even though we had some sick, some awesome tunes, but that's okay. It's fine. Um, and then I was also part of, I also did, I was also in the salsa dancing club, which is not something I would have done myself, like at all, but I, because I was so nervous about uh, starting university and all that stuff, and I wanted to meet new friends, uh, I was like, might as well try dancing and it was it was a really fun class because there were so few of us there were like 10 to 15 a week we all got to know each other pretty well and some of the instructors would even like there's still people who are from SFU so there were like fifth fourth and fifth year students um they would stop and talk to me in the halls and I was like this is so weird I actually am talking to people 
that I've made from friends at university. So that was awesome. But SFU also has like a ton of cool clubs. Like their clubs days took up two to three days. Um, and there were just so many that it, there were so many things I wanted to do that just aligned with other things that it was so hard to fit all of the things I wanted to do. But they've also uh, had, they had a dog therapy event and they had like a whole bunch of dogs with their therapists and stuff. And there was line was so long to go to it, but it was definitely worth it. They, it was, it was a good event. Um, they also had bunny yoga, which I didn't get to go to because I had too much homework to do, but I heard from my friends that it was a lot of fun. Uh, even with COVID and everything, they've actually had a lot of uh, events that I've gone to. Um, a lot of trivia nights. I've actually found that I've been more involved since COVID um, than before, but they've also had a lot of trivia nights. Um, like they had Grey's Anatomy and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, if either of you are fran fans. And uh, yeah, I think that's all. Great, thank you. Wow, that I didn't, I had no idea that you did all those very artistic kind of cool things. And that's awesome. I totally gave up on band after grade eight. So I'm glad some people carry it all the way through high school um, and, and farther. Uh, I'll quickly just uh, pull up just a question related to the jazz band. Hannah asks, uh, what kind of level do you play at? So maybe you can address that. Um, we played at, it was, it was very chill. It's not like high school jazz band where you have to get a grade and everything but there were some easier ones but we also played some ones that we had, like I had to sit down and actually look at and practice like you had to think about it it wasn't just anything that you could pull out of the spot but it was we took the time and we knew that that song was particularly hard so as a group we decided to spend more time on that one week or if everybody like around midterm season practice got kind of lame and we just kind of played through the pieces once and had everybody go but yeah that's around if that answered your question great thank you so we'll have more time for questions but i want to lastly feature flora who is a rem student and she will talk about what she's done while she's at sfu Wow, this is so great to like listen to other people talk about what they're involved in. It actually like motivates me to like try <laughs> to be somewhat active in school. Cause you know, it's like, it's hard, especially now since everything is online to like meet new friends. And I remember my first semester at SFU, it was really hard for me to meet friends cause if I met someone, it was mostly like a semester and then we will talk for that semester and then we would maybe we'll say hi in the like when we bought into them at school, but it wasn't anything more than that. So uh, I think my second year was when I tried to push myself to actually try to join clubs. And I like how um, Jonathan mentioned the Seattle trip because I remember seeing it on, the, on Instagram and be like, oh my gosh, I really want to travel, but I don't know anyone that's going. So I don't know if I should go because I'm like, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty shy person. So, but at the end I went and I'm so glad I actually went because that's when, that's where I met like Marina, Evie, like Jonathan and that's how I became part of the environment team and like started working with Donna, which was, which is such a blessing. And yeah, um, I started when I applied to SFU, I actually applied as a psychology student and psychology was fun, but like, I don't know, after taking some environment classes, I became like, that actually interested me more. So that's why I transferred to REM in my second yeah I think I transferred in my second year and I'm not a part of any of like the student unions which so it sucks but I am a part of this club called UNICEF it's one of the largest humanitarian clubs on campus you guys should check it out we host like uh, we host events where we raise money for child protection um 
for child survival for food and any marginalized groups around the world that needs extra support. And we just bring light into some of these topics that are not mentioned in social media. And it's such a really tight knit community. You like, I met a lot of friends there and I think it's more of like a family. And like, if we have, if we're struggling with anything, we can always like count on each other and like talk to each other. So. You guys should check out UNICEF. It's such a really great club. So yeah, and there's also other clubs that I want to join, but I'm just never actually <laughs> went to any of the meetings, which sucks because I know like they have they're so great. Like hiking, I love hiking. So I did sign up for hiking, but I just never got it. it's like it just never happened. So yeah, there's so many like great clubs on campus that you should check out hopefully when hopefully when we get to go back to campus soon so yeah that's my that's my story thank you flora i know that was awesome yeah i wish we had more hours in the day right i'd be in every club if i could i i, I forced myself as well as a shy student to join two clubs in my first year so i joined my student union and i said i gotta pick one more so i joined the Cancer Society at SFU. And I met some amazing people there like that you get to know even after a semester, right? And people who I would still wave to in the hallways four years later. So that is amazing. Um, and that's a great club as well. And they do the Relay for Life every year. So yeah, let's, let me see if there's any questions here for any of our student panel. And thank you for sharing your, you know, um, extracurricular experiences because these personal encounter, these personal perspectives are really um, good for you all to hear, I hope. Um, right. Just to, yeah, feel free to, just to look oh, yeah, back to um, Teresa's question about uh, transferring and thanks, Jonathan jumped in and, and answered that. So that was awesome. Um, and I think as you've heard from all of these students, the best way to jump in and integrate into student life is just to um, step outside your comfort zone and and try and join a club or anything so whether you're um, a first year student straight out of high school or whether you're transferring in uh, from a college it, it's the same go to clubs day find a club that has something of interest to you uh, join your student union. There's always lots of stuff going on and tons of ways to get involved and just find the thing that um, matches your interest. And Jonathan, I want to hear about the tea club. Now, the, the person to actually talk about it is Evie, since she yeah. is there. I just participate. Evie is um, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mention tea club um, when I was talking about the ass but um yeah jonathan's a, a member um i'm actually an executive for t club um it's actually one of the only clubs i've found that is still active and actually more active online now that it's during the pandemic which is strange um during like like and the whole the whole purpose of the club is to drink tea if you are wondering that is that is the whole thing. All we do is we meet and we drink tea and that's that's the whole purpose. Um, and in person, we had maybe six to 15 people show up at, at a meeting, which was like really nice and and really just like quaint, you know, it was it was good for introverts and outgoing people alike. It was, it was good that way. And now online, there's like, 20 people sometimes that show up and um, we're just on discord we have a discord server um, so yeah and we have and now too because we can't uh, serve you tea uh, we've been mailing tea out to members um, for free so it's uh, it, it's been working out pretty well it's been really popular um, but yeah definitely just check out I, I know there's a list of clubs at the SFSS webpage. Um, definitely just go through them. There's like hundreds of them um, and just see what piques your interest. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, we have a question here. Has anyone done the co-op for environmental science? Has anyone done, well, I mean, for, I'll just comment. When you're an environment co-op student, you can apply to, you know, any position that you're qualified for, but someone out of these group may have done a science related co-op, anyone? Can't remember. Um, I can talk about my co-op right now because I'm actually in one at the moment, mm -hmm. but it's, you can apply for any type of co-op. Uh, for mine, mine was a, a data related uh, co-op that's funded from the federal government and it was a short-term one. So yeah, it, it's a lot of fun to, for, uh, or well, actually my, my co-op is, is about like data. So we, we collected data from last semester uh, and we're analyzing it and we're putting it on a, on a data hub. So, so that was Pivot 2020. Uh, you know, there are others at the moment. Uh, I'm also applying for co-ops. Uh, there are, you know, ones for like, you know, urban planning, geographic information sciences. Uh, there's, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, environmental science ones like from the government. So yeah, those are the types that you can apply for. Yeah, and also I will mention that our next Zoom social will focus very closely on co-op. So we will have our environment co-op coordinator speaking all about the program, and we will have co-op students themselves, a lot of them who are in co-op right now, ask it, uh, answering questions like just like this. So make sure to come to that next one. And Marino, maybe you can tell a bit about your co-op job with um... Was it with uh, TransLink or was oh. it with the airport? Yeah, so I was also thinking of that. So I did a, an environment related co-op two years ago for eight months at the airport here in Vancouver. And it was just an essentially like an assistant or an intern to the entire environment department, which I didn't know existed. So I would assist waste management and um, contaminated sites, people, water quality, water consumption, there was all these different specialists that I would report to and sort of help them with their projects and do data analysis and get out of the office all the time. And sometimes I would walk 10 kilometers in a day just inside the airport. So like there's so many cool jobs you can get while you're in school. And I'm sure I'll go off about it at the next session because I love talking about co-op. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of science related ones. Like I'm not um super science oriented like hardcore but there are like geology and field work jobs in the environment where you can work in remote places and things like that um i see some more questions rolling in i'm glad okay i think they've been doing a good job answering them as yeah. they've been rolling in too so that's awesome guys thanks for yeah. all of that keep the um, questions many, coming i'll just read them quickly how many of the classes are really big um can i answer that recent question yes go for it um oh, yes there there isn't a coffee club but tea club is secretly the coffee club we're also secretly the hot chocolate club and secretly the stationary club um wow <laughs> Um, we, we are the precursor to the now knitting club. Um, <laughs> just, just check it out. It's the hot drink club. How about that? <laughs> That's amazing. You guys are kind of like posers. Oh my gosh. Fake tea club. We're exposing the tea club today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, it's sort of like the hobby club or like the yeah chilling out club. I love that. Exactly. There's another great question here so for all the SFU students who are in their higher years what is something you wish you did in your first year and maybe each of you can answer that and then maybe I'll chime in if I think of something I guess I can go first 
um, since I'm in my last semester, so I have a little bit of thought on that. Um, a lot of things that I should, I wish I would have done. Um, I actually applied co-op pretty late, so I guess that's one of the things that I regretted for not doing it in my first year and not starting thinking about it until um, later on in a term. In case you're very interested in doing a co-op, um, you know, there, it, there is some sort of like a deadline before you can apply. So just, you know, keep a tap on the time um, and don't wait until you're so far into your program until starting thinking about that. Um, and I would also wish maybe I, I can join a lot more clubs because like everyone was talking about, there's so many more fun clubs um, at SFU where I can make a connection. So um, definitely go check out um, all the different clubs that are at SFU. Um, I believe they, they will, will have uh, club days in the beginning of each semester. So definitely go attend this um, and see which one you're interested in. Maybe you can find a new club. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Justin. I think I can kind of like say something. Um, I think for me is just I just took classes that are within my major for my first year, and I kind of wished I took classes outside my major, major and like kind of explore other things because I didn't, I like, I just thought that like psych classes were it. And then I took environment class and then I fell in love. So that's how I changed majors. So I just wished like, kind of like ventured off a little bit. Very good point. Uh, I wasn't here first year, but I'll I'll talk about my first semester as a transfer student. Uh, I wish I joined rowing club. Uh, I had a coworker who was the uh, during the summer that I came in was the head of the rowing club. Tried to recruit anybody who was uh, to join their club, and I I didn't because I would have to wake up at four a.m. in the morning. But, but it's a great way to get active and uh, they, they row at Burnaby Lake. And apparently they have a lot of uh, uh, competitions across BC. So I guess you get to travel a lot and you get to stay fit. <laughs> cool. Love that. Um, um, I, yeah, I guess go I can also go. Um, I was also a transfer student and, and so I, I can't really speak to my first or second year, but um, in, I guess my, at the end of my second year and the start of my third year, um, I guess, I guess I wish I could have joined clubs and my student union sooner. I only joined my student union, like officially, like I went to events and things, but I only actually started going to the meetings and, um, having an active role in it in my last two years. And so I wish I'd joined that sooner. Um, just it's different seeing it from behind the scenes rather than just going to events. That's all I can really say. Awesome. Emma, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just say very similar to what Flora was saying, but definitely don't take courses just within your major. Um, I was originally an English major and I only took, like I took two English courses and then two other courses. And luckily one of them was an archeology span course. And I realized that I really wanted to switch really badly, but especially your first year because you get first pick at courses, take the ones that you find interesting because you hit your second year and it gets really hard to get some of the courses that you want. Yeah, that's a good point too. Um, I would agree, take courses outside of your major. I did that my entire degree. Every semester, I'd usually take one elective at least. And it changed the trajectory of what courses I like to take overall as well. So yeah. And then the other thing that came to mind is, although I joined my student union in my first semester, I wish I had taken the plunge and taken on a higher executive role earlier on because they were nudging me to do that and I was just too scared and too introverted to take on like the co-chair role and I ended up doing it later later but you know I think it's not as hard as you think it's going to be and you can take on those leadership roles and it opens a lot of doors for you 
especially coming from someone who was super shy, somewhat shy when I started university. Uh, another question I saw here was about uh, workload. So was first year course workload a lot? Um, some people have answered already. Taking three to four courses were manageable. Five was like double full time. I would agree with that. I have never taken five courses and I never will. <laughs> and some people can handle it. But, you know, especially if you want to volunteer too, it's good to balance it out. But I think I, if I can think back to my first semester, it didn't feel super overwhelming, but that's just me. So I don't know if others have thoughts on that. Um, I just want to add, like, it really depends on the course you're taking and how the workload is for that course. What I like to do before, because there's a one week time line of like when you can drop the course or not. And I like to look at the syllabus and see like when the exams are, when assignments are due and see how well they line up with my other courses. And that also tells you like how hard the class will be. And you know, like you can also ask other people that have taken the course and ask them if they think the course is easy or not. And that kind of determines if you should take, like how many courses you should take. Yeah, there's a Facebook page called uh, Must Knows, um, uh, something like that. Must Knows, yeah, someone's nodding. Uh, and I found that really helpful. That is something I wish I had joined first year because I didn't know anything about any of the courses. And I didn't know anyone, so I just went blindly into it. And I would say find something like that to help you with your courses. I'm actually taking five courses right now, and I took five last semester. And I would say that it really depends on the courses that you take. Uh, because I'm taking one this semester and two last semester that are distance ed. They're technically made for online learning. I found that a lot more manageable. Um, because they their workload was different and was spread out differently. But again, to each their own. Yeah, I, I also want to add on to that too. It's, it depends on the courses. And I also would, I always registered to five courses and then drop two of them. Um, three courses is still full time. Make sure that you also look at the unit requirements um, because nine units is full time. I once took three courses, but it was 14 credits. So um, always make sure that it's, you know, what, what it actually is, because a five credit course is going to be a lot more work than a three credit course. Yeah, very good points. And any other thoughts? I quickly jump in here because I kind of want to answer um, Theresa's uh, question earlier about um, transitioning from um, other school uh, to uh, SFU. I actually had a hard time in the beginning just um, because, you know, in the college it was much smaller and everyone kind of know each other. And when I transferred to SFU, you know, similar to when you transfer from uh, high school to SFU, it's like a we have your first year classes is always hundreds of students and you feel like maybe you're not so close with each other and um, socially uh, if you feel that you're you're kind of isolated um, by everyone you know your peers then I would highly recommend that you 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 join a student union that's the first place that you know the that, that can help you with that, you know, just building that connection and then also joining the clubs and volunteering. I think SFSS is a good, is a good place. Um, if you're coming from, um, you know, other culture, you can join the International Student Center. Um, there's also international clubs as well. You know, I've joined the Vietnamese, Japanese clubs, and these are all very fun um, club to join and just to make connections. And then for academics uh, wise, um, you, when you're in the classes and you feel kind of stuck, um, there's always some resources that you can go to. I believe um, the, the Geography Student Union has a Discord uh, channel that we have a study session. Um, we have some lower classes such as the Geography uh, 255 and some other courses that you can join and just discuss with your classmates or people who have taken it. So um, I suggest you check that out. Um, 
yeah. I would agree that one thing that I, I wish I had done in my first year was um, find more people in, within the classes to help me if I was having difficulties because I would just suffer silently <laughs> in the corner and I wouldn't ask for help or anything. So don't have there, everyone's really nice. Don't hesitate, ask the TAs, ask your prof. Don't hesitate to ask anything, even if you're struggling. Good advice. One more, we have a few minutes left, so maybe we can address this question. How did you guys find your professors? Do you have any advice on how to form the best relationships? to utilize the most out of a course? Very good question. Anyone can. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, all of them, even during an online uh, environment. Uh, best time to form relationships with professors or just go to their office hours, say hi. If you have any problems, just let them know because they're, they're there to help. Otherwise, they're going to sit there and do nothing. It's, <laughs> you know, that's that's where that's where it's the best way to um, talk to professors or talk to them after class. Oh, and also, if you are interested in research, uh, you can ask for research assistant opportunities. So I did that, and I applied for a undergrad uh, research assistant uh, award. Definitely. If you get to know your profs and they know your face and your name, you're much more likely to get hired for those sort of positions. Or if you're going into grad school, you know, getting a supervisor, someone that knows you, that's good, you know. And, you know, I've used professors for references for awards and things like that. All right. Well, look at us, 5.58. Great timing. If there's any last minute questions, feel free to put them into the chat. Otherwise, we will begin to wind up. Um, a few closing comments. These Zoom socials are going to be hosted every two weeks. Uh, the next one, as Marina mentioned, is scheduled for April 7th. And we've got a, another exciting slate of speakers for you. Um, we're gonna have our first year geography professor, Andrew Perkins join us. And he is a favorite amongst current students. So um, I do hope you'll come back and join us. Um, we also are gonna have our co-op coordinator coming and a group of current students who are either currently in a co-op work term or have completed one or more of them. So you'll get to hear about their jobs and how that has helped shape their career path. Um, so it's gonna be a good one. So uh, mark April 7th on your uh, calendars um, and watch your emails. You'll get an invitation again in your email. Um, also, if you haven't yet joined the Facebook group for new incoming students, please check that out. Marina is going to put the, the link in the chat for that as well. And finally, she'll also put our email addresses um, for herself and, and I in there. If you have any questions in the coming months, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're really here to, to help you guys uh, feel confident and comfortable coming into September and, and joining our community at SFU. Any last minute questions coming in? I think I think we're good. Well, thank you all so much. A special thank you to all of our current student speakers. Thank you for coming and, and sharing your experiences with our new students. Um, and thanks to all the new students for joining us. We hope that you learned something about us and we hope to see you again on April 7th. So take care everyone and have a great evening. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.